Hello everyone, welcome back to Growing Up with Godzilla. My name is Donnie Winter and this is my show where I have conversations with Godzilla fans about how they've grown with the character and franchise over time. We are on season three of the show, which is still very hard for me to believe. And I know I keep repeating that every single episode and I probably will forever until it's over. But I've had such wonderful conversations with such great human beings. Um, and tonight I'm really excited to have someone on who I've known for 20 years, which is a very long time when it comes to thinking about how things have shifted on the internet over the years, right? So I would like to introduce all of you to my dear friend, Jesse of Great Lummox Productions. Hello, my friend, how are you? I'm great. How are you? I am doing very well. I'm stoked to have you here because, well, like I mentioned, we've we've known each other for 20 years. We I feel old. I know. I feel I feel <laughs> old too. I feel like we can't like those people like you and Cindy who I've known since like the message board days. I feel like we've all kind of grown up together of sorts, right? Which is Internet kind of the next is close. Yeah, yeah. So, so I've, I'm always grateful to have people on who I've known for this long. So we go all the way back to Rodan's Roost and, and Kaiju File. Like, what was it like for you being introduced to like the message board world way back in the early to mid 2000s? Um, I thought it was really cool. Um, at that point in my life, I mean, I a lot. I know a lot of your guests have. They said they didn't have a lot of people to watch Godzilla with. Um, I grew up when I was like three or f like four or five years old. I was I would watch the the Hanna Barbera show. Mm. Um, I was I would watch it religiously, and then my older brother came over one day, and he said, "I'm going to show you a real Godzilla movie," and he showed me the VHS tape to Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla, the '74. Um. And I was just glued to that screen and this, the visuals and the violence and the kaiju action, it was, it changed my life forever. And I would show it to my friends and uh, my next door neighbor, who's still my best friend to this day, uh, we both love that movie and we would, you know, play pretend and pretend to play out the movie. And, but, you know, as I got a little bit older, I started realizing not as many people were into Godzilla or thought it was cool the way I did. So coming across the message boards was pretty eye-opening to realize how many different people like Godzilla, like from different backgrounds and ethnicities and lifestyles. And it was, I think that that made a big impact on my life. Absolutely. Same here. I, I think because I know like in the past few episodes or in the past on the show, I've talked about like, I had like a few people who were interested in Godzilla with me, but a lot of the time, like I did feel quite isolated so that, that when I finally took that step, when my parents were like, you can use the internet. The first thing I started doing was searching Godzilla profiles on like that old GeoCities website that used to exist years ago. Barry's Temple for Godzilla. Kaiju um, HQ was one I, I went to a lot. I, oh my gosh, I have not thought of Kaiju HQ in so long. I forgot. Yes, I forgot about that one. That yeah. one, um, there was another uh, Club Tokyo or Monster Zero, Rodan's yeah. Roost, of course. And um, I've mentioned Mothra's Shrine a million times on the show because I used to <laughs> be obsessed with that. So even though it was just just the translations of Mothra songs. It wasn't like anything overly elaborate, but it was, I oh, lived yeah. on that site. I lived on that site. Mm -hmm. But like once I, uh, I think the first forum that I ever joined was uh, Kaiju Kingdom way back yeah. in like, I think it was like 2003. Mm -hmm. And I remember distinctly that my username was Megamoth47 at that time. <laughs> And um, and that's when I like after that I like branched out and I joined like uh, Kaiju File and like Rodan or uh, Toho Kingdom and and the mm -hmm. uh, Club Tokyo forums, and then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna create my own. I'm gonna create my own because I yeah. I wanted a, a a spot where people could go just to like nerd out and write fan fiction. 
Mm -hmm. because I became very obsessed with like, especially on Rodan's Roost, like C.L. Werner's fan fiction and my friend, uh, Christine Graham's fan fiction, Cindy's fan fiction. Eventually when we met, um, I was drawn to your fan fiction. And I think that for a long while, like, especially when we migrated to Kaiju Galaxy, we really bonded over just that fan fiction writing. So I think my, I think moving to Kaiju Galaxy was, necessary because i um kaiju file was great and there was a lot of great people on there and i try to remember it more fondly but there was some borderline sociopaths on that (laughs) site too and i all all the good ones all the good people that i remember like i'm trying to think like oh kaiju file wasn't that bad but all those all the good ones ended up going to kaiju galaxy yeah well and so because toho kingdom also i remember i remember there was like People would tell me at that time, they were like, Donnie, do you want to create a forum and then invite people from Kaiju File and Toho Kingdom on there? Because they were like, there's going to be a war. You know, like we were so dramatic and we were so dramatic and angsty. It's like, oh, no, this person posted that. This person sabotaged this. And it's just like we were just kids on a forum wanting to talk about Godzilla. Like, what yeah. was you know, it's funny looking back on it now, but I do think that on Kaiju Galaxy, we were able to at least create a wholesome creative space that was active for a good 10 years. You know, we kind of tried having a comeback a few years ago, but like, if, like I've mentioned before, like um, message boards, it, it's really hard to keep a lot of activity on them when there's like social media always Um, looming over everything else so but it's time to turn it into a facebook page i know like i do have like a facebook like page for it but i'm thinking like maybe a group or something like like an actual like group yeah so a lot of people think that only older folks like facebook but i mean we're older folks now so it works Oh, we're the older folks now. That's an existential (laughs) crisis. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, you've already shared a little bit of like how you were introduced to Godzilla. So like you, so was the Hanna-Barbera show the first one you ever, was that like your first exposure to Godzilla? My folks used to tell me, because I used to, we used to go visit my dad's family in Indiana and my aunt Sandy, R.I.P., she was into a lot of old monster movies like 20 million miles to earth she had a few godzilla movies um she might have shown me some when i was probably too young to remember which you know i might have been watching Ghidorah, the three-headed monster and mothra versus godzilla before but in my memory the first one is godzilla versus mecha godzilla mm-hmm good selections though by the way no like because there's there are a few people i've interviewed so far who like their first exposure was the hanna barbera Mm -hmm. series which i always find to be interesting because i feel like i just hear so much more that it's like a movie or something that really was their first entry point but like like the hanna barbera series is so beloved like i feel like I, f- I wish it would have gotten more exposure at the time and was actually longer than it actually is. But mm-hmm. um, so like as you continued, so like obviously like you were, you were how old about that when that happened? Like were you about like four or five, maybe six years old? Okay. When I so, saw Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla. So that's pretty young, right? So as you grew older, like how did your exposure to Godzilla movies progress into like your late single digits and teenage years well we had um you know we had the local blockbuster but i got a lot of exposure at one of the more the one of the more an independent owned uh, video store there was a nice older lady there and she had like all the sandy frank dubbed uh, gamera films so i got into mm-hmm. gamera there i think that's where i first rented godzilla versus hedra um and there was a, there was another store. We had a couple video stores back back in the day. I remember I saw the cover to Godzilla 1985, and I was like, "What?" Because he still he still kind of had that Showa look, but it was like you had, you had the Super X coming across the front, and oh I yeah, in the back, and Raymond Burr was in it. And I was like, "Oh crap! I got to see this." And 
Love the movie. Cried at the end. And I think it might have been the same video store uh, where I saw the saw the that iconic cover to Godzilla vs. Biollante, mm. which holds a special place in my heart. It came out the same year I was born, and that that movie was something else to me. Like I, even as a little kid, I loved the scenes where he's fighting Biollante and yanking the vines out of his body and like that uh, that goodness. sick noise when he pulls it out of his hand. I think that's why that film was so, I mean, cause I've mentioned this at nauseam throughout the series, but like that film is even, it's not like, it's my favorite Godzilla film right now, which I know everybody, Mothra is my favorite, but Godzilla versus Biollante is my favorite Godzilla film, but I digress. Uh, I think that's kind of what really unsettled me as a kid when I watched it, because like of all the like, the textures and the sound mm-hmm. effects and everything like that, like the the squelching and the dribbling, and I, I like I, as a kid, like I was just so oversensitized. I was just like, "This is terrifying." <laughs> when she's when she's rushing at Godzilla, like coming at the camera, that that scene always always got me going. Oh, I know. And now that now when I'm watching that, I'm just like, "Yes, you get him!" Like you know, it's, <laughs> when, whereas back then I was just like terrified. I can't watch. Um, yeah. But yeah, like it, I, I just remember um, finding that film so scary. And maybe that's why I love it so much now is because that was the one Godzilla film that kind of made me look at Godzilla in a completely different light. Because for me, in my head, it was always like hero Godzilla, 70s, 60s yeah. films. But then you see Godzilla versus Biollante and you don't really know who's the villain, who's the protagonist, who, you know. Um, it's just two forces of nature against each other. Like in the other. countryside. And I think this I think the special effects had a lot to do with it too, because I think of all the suit mation films, that, that one probably has the best special effects. The mm-hmm. scene where it was at what's his Colonel Gondo? Yeah. Right after they shoot all the antibacterial uh rockets into godzilla and he's turning around and i think he's getting ready to leave and godzilla's right behind him oh and it's a window yeah it's flawless it's just a flawless i don't know if it was green screen or a a mat or what 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 they did but it's like he's right there behind him and that's probably one of the most memorable scenes in a godzilla movie is him sneaking up on gondo right i think that's why i mean i would argue that the film very much is like has like a cult following in the Godzilla fandom. There have been polls, like even in Japan, that have r- people rated this film as like their favorite Godzilla film. Yeah. And and it, it's just mind boggling to me because in 1989, when the film came out, it was kind of a flop. Like it did not measure up at all to the success of yeah. the Return of Godzilla. And now, like fast forward, like like over 30 years later it's people are loving it and celebrating it and it's kind of like the benchmark of like what we think quality Godzilla looks like quality exactly. classic Godzilla looks like right so and it's crazy it's funny that, it's funny that that's the consensus now because the director was not very nice about previous versions of Godzilla because i believe Tomoyuki Tanaka was still the producer and Mm-hmm. had this young guy come in and said, oh, that last Godzilla movie was nothing original. And then the, the ones, like the old ones where he's boxing other monsters look stupid. And, you know, we're going to do something new. And, you know, sometimes you need that kind of outside perspective, even if you don't necessarily agree with it, to right. create something truly special. But then the and same clearly, thing kind of happened with the 98 version. And we all know how that went. Right. Well, clearly this this person was onto something though considering like we got a kaiju battle that we've never th- fathomed before you know for a very unique kaiju creation like a very mm-hmm. unique character that still to this day you know over 30 years later remains to one of the most unique characters that we've seen in the Godzilla franchise. So I still haven't brought her back. I know, see it like I I'm I'm really wanting them to bring her back, but being that I hold Biolante in like this very sacred space of perfection, like I'm always just worried. To, like if they do bring her back, I hope they don't botch it. I hope. Yeah. I hope that it's like worthy 
of her being brought back, right? Yeah. Granted, like, I would argue that the MonsterVerse, I mean, if we think of it as in the MonsterVerse, like, I feel like they've done a pretty good job, um, at least in my opinion, re like, recapturing the, and kind of, like, re-innovating the classic kaiju. So, like, I feel like they yeah. could do that. Yeah. but Because uh, they, they get a lot of flack for the human characters, but I think they make up for it in the way they portray the monsters. Right, yeah. Especially Ghidorah. Like, oh, yeah. I think, I think everyone wanted to see two of the heads get mad at each other and get in a, in a fight like they did in King of the Monsters, and that was... And just the facial expressions and everything it was perfect it was wonderful i like and i know that people have often criticized a lot of films these days for like oh it's just pandering to nostalgia it's like what i don't really think there's anything wrong with that so long as the so long as it's, it's paying honor. Yeah. yeah as, as long as it's honoring the original creation like i think that that's fine and when you think about it there are many other classic godzilla films that are just purely fan service and nostalgia like the heisei era godzilla versus king Ghidorah, godzilla versus mothra godzilla versus Mega godzilla 2 all were complete fan service <laughs> just yeah a lot of fan service right well, especially godzilla versus mothra because that felt a lot like a remake of the original mothra versus godzilla which was kind of a retelling of the first mothra film they all kind of follow a similar story right but sometimes just adding something a little bit different like godzilla minus one for instance oh yeah it's the story it's not that different it's not really i don't want to say it's not original because it definitely is but it's a very formulaic godzilla movie but just setting it like post uh world war ii like just after the war ended just that little change and putting it in a different time period uh can really make a difference like with godzilla versus mothra throwing in batra for instance, oh, yeah. just making like a little change to something formulaic can really make a big difference. Well, and I think that, I mean, when we're thinking of like the gravitas of Godzilla minus one, I think that what really makes it so different, along with what you said, is the fact that the human characters are believable and rooted in like a lot of realism, right? Yeah. Like, I, I feel like many of the characters that we've seen in past Godzilla films, like, I no, don't get me wrong, I think there are, are quite a few that we could pick up on that are really good human characters, right? But I don't think we've really connected emotionally. Like, there's been kind of, like, there's not really been a, pa like, a pathos with mm -hmm. these characters that we've seen until Godzilla Minus One, right? No. And I think it's because, like, we are, like, intermixed with the the kaiju moments we are seeing these humans reacting and being impacted and affected by everything that's going on and it's consistent we're not like getting bits and pieces in it just kind of being open-ended we're getting it consistently developed yeah. throughout the entirety of the film so yeah watching the the kamikaze pilot just i, I thought it was perfect just that that scene because he had just had a, a a meltdown or something uh, i'm trying i think it was the first time no it was the second time because he he had two big meltdowns in the movie yeah and I, i'm having a hard time remembering names right now but uh, his name got, was shikajima and then shikajima. and then the engineer that we see at the beginning of the movie and then at the end that his name is tachibana i remember tachibana because i connect that to yuri tachibana from <laughs> from gmk so yeah that scene where He's like, maybe I can have a life. I'm going to let it all go. And then next scene, Godzilla's tearing everything up. And I am so glad I didn't listen to the soundtrack to this movie ahead of time or look up anything about it. Because when he walks into the city, I didn't think they were going to use, I didn't know if they were going to use Akira Fukube music. Because mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need that big Godzilla theme in every single movie. There's been plenty of great ones that didn't have it. But when that theme just blasts and he comes into the city and she's staring out the window at him, oh, man, I felt like a little kid in theater. Oh, I had goosebumps. I had goosebumps. Um, going back to Shikajima, the main character, like, like, I think that's what made his character so innately human is, like, after the post-war trauma, it was like, one, I still feel like I'm fighting a war, but 
too, like, I'm still trying to figure out how to learn to live, right? So, yeah. like, following his journey and, like, learning to live again, like, that was, in like, I, from a mental health standpoint, like, I thought that that was, like, an incredibly thoughtful way of incorporating some larger themes that are interwoven with, like, the metaphor of Godzilla that we, you know, have seen. So, um, I, honestly, personally, I would say, if, if I were to pick, like, a top three favorite films, and I'm going to ask you yours here in just a second, if I were to pick my top three favorite Godzilla films right now, they would be Godzilla vs. Biollante is number one. Still, it's going to be hard to knock that one from number one for me. Uh, Godzilla minus one, and then Godzilla Tokyo SOS is my third one. What is your top three? My Over top these three. years, what are you, what, like, what have you, like, what are you feeling today as your top three Godzilla films? Well, number one is always going to be the original Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla. Um, I just, I, I just think they, they really brought it back. Um, not that I didn't have any issues with the the previous Godzilla movies, but I think just some of the the subtle changes they made, especially the look of Godzilla, because mm -hmm. it was kind of the same design from Megalon, but something I was I, I was thinking about was just like how happy the eyes looked in Megalon. Mm -hmm. Like he looked so happy, like coming in there and just beating the shit out of Gigon and Megalon, <laughs> and like he just looks like a big happy goofball. And I think just narrowing his brows mm -hmm. for Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla came with some of the the best scenes and most memorable for me. Like when he comes out of the ocean at the end to fight on uh, Okinawa, like you can see that this dude's pissed. Like you broke my best friend's jaw, mm -hmm. you made me look like a fool, and I'm gonna beat the shit out of you right now. And that and this. Um, Masaru Sato's score in that scene is just so powerful to me. Yeah, I feel um, like that soundtrack does not get celebrated enough. Like, I feel like there are certain aspects of it that people gravitate to, but it's such a beautiful score. Oh, yeah. It's the, such a beautiful score. The song to wake up King Seesaw was that... I'll listen to that while I'm driving. That's, that's a great tune. Oh, God. I <laughs> Jesse, I used to have all these songs memorized. Like that one, every version of any Mothra song I used to have memorized. I'm not going to do a live performance right now. I'm going to save all of you <laughs> your sanity in that. Um, but I, whenever there is some sort of like, like vocal musicality to any Godzilla film, I'm just like immediately I'm there. I'm like, okay, I am ready well, to go. You're a Mothra fan, so naturally absolutely yeah and i thought masaru sato's score in uh ever a horror, horror of the deep like it's kind of hard to I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the guy who who scored the original mothra but i think if a oh music, uh yuji koseki yeah that's who it is i think so yeah that was that's a great score but i think if a kube's music's most widely recognized with mothra but i think masaru sato had a pretty sick Mothra chant and Ebira Horror of the Deep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And even though like obviously it was Pear Bambi as the as the new Mothra fairies instead of the peanuts, like I feel like they did a great job. Like they did a great job singing, but they they sure looked bored in that. They, they, <laughs> well, I don't really yeah. think they were given much to do. Like they were just they yeah. were like I, I just imagine whoever was in charge, they were just like just gaze blankly at this matte landscape skate painting of a moth asleep and sing to it. No, but I mean, we just, uh, I just showed my wife, we've been watching slowly getting through the Godzilla series, me and my wife. And I think after this next rewatch, I would probably put this at my number two is a uh, Ghidorah, the three headed monster. Nice. Um, and the peanuts, the peanuts were so good. They were such great. Like they, the way they could speak in unison with like no issue at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I guess was real. I, if you watch a uh, big action Bill stuff, and uh, everyone should go watch his stuff. You need to, you need to interview that guy. Yeah, we like, love big action Bill, and I, no. I hopefully will manifest him getting on the show with this conversation. I would love to see that, <laughs> but um. 
like as I got as I get older, there's like certain things you know you rewatch something so many times you're always gonna pick pick up something, and I don't. There was years and years where I would watch Godzilla movies all the time and really wouldn't pick up on things that much, but I don't really watch Godzilla all that often, and it never leaves my mind. I'm still a huge fan. It's just you know you get busy, mm-hmm. but rewatching it this time. I went into it because I was going to thinking of things I could point out to my wife. And one thing that I thought was very powerful was the idea of Mothra convincing Godzilla and Rodan to help mm-hmm. fight King Ghidorah. Because she's going up against not only him, but a, a whole another monster that are in the middle of beating the crap out of each other. Mm-hmm. And she's got to plead for help from the same monster that killed her mother. Whether yeah. she knew that or not, you know, she was wow. already dead by the time they hatched. I never thought of that. But I just thought that was pretty powerful. And then they're just in the way that instead of killing Mothra, they're just like, no, humans are mean. They're bullying us, which to mm-hmm. the monsters, it might actually seem that way. And then it's like her selflessness of going off and being like, well, I can't convince you to. I guess I'm going to go try. Them exactly. seeing that is what really gets the. No, I think. I love that you focused in on that because I feel like that film is the first film in which we get to see like the kaiju get developed as characters, like when with regard to like their intentions and their motivations. Yeah. Um, and I think that that was like like Godzilla, Rodan, Mothra, even Ghidorah. They all had like their own motivations, and you could kind of like tell their demeanors and dispositions, which I thought was really cool. And something that I, I don't know how I never really picked up on this. So Mothra's getting blasted all over the place by Ghidorah and everyone's going, oh no. <laughs> and then Godzilla just kind of comes around the hillside. And it doesn't seem like he's still really into it. He's just kind of like, what's going on? I think I'm going to watch this, see how this goes. And then there's this really cool shot, which is Godzilla's POV. And you see Ghidorah and it pans down to Mothra and you see her get blasted. and Right after that, Godzilla roars and just rushes in. Mm-hmm. So I think actually seeing this poor little, this poor little creature getting blasted around, like made something click in his head, and he just like rushes in, and then all hell breaks loose. And I just like everyone brings up the watching Mothra go into it is what convinced them, but I never really noticed that Godzilla, you know, he peeks around, but watching her get hurt, like. Mm-hmm. Something clicked in his head. That's interesting. Yeah, I know. I'll have to rewatch it. It's been a while since I've watched that film. But did your wife enjoy the film? She did. Um, she said it was cute. Oh yay! Oh, that <laughs> that is good. That is correct progression, Works. I'd say. Cute so words. that's your that's your second one, right? What is your mm-hmm. third one? My third one. Oh man, that's a tough one. <laughs> Oh, because it's been so long um, since I, you know, not watching them every day anymore. Um, I'd probably say Godzilla minus one. Yeah, I saw that that one twice. I missed the black and white version. Me too. I didn't go to see that one, but I did see it once with my brother, who he's a few years younger than me, and he's just as big a Godzilla fan as I am. And then the second time, I took my wife to see it. I love it. Yeah, I didn't get to see the black and white one either, but I'm hoping that it's released somewhere digitally because I would love to watch it regardless. But Mm -hmm. I think that's a good top three. So expanding a little bit further, I mean, we've talked about like kaiju that we've gravitated to. How about like human characters, like from the classic films? Are there like maybe one or two human characters that you've really fallen in love with over the years from the classic films? Lately, I've really been going over in my head just the entire ensemble of uh, the original film because mm. like I was mentioning with the, that scene in, in Ghidorah, the three headed monster, there's something I've, the scene I've been, I need to rewatch it again, but there's this scene that I think as I got older, it kind of, it affected me more the scene at the end. So Godzilla, you know, you see this, the look of awe on everyone's look is on their on their this look of awe on people's faces as they're watching this gigantic creature like screaming into the sky as it runs out of breath and then sinks back to the bottom of the ocean mm-hmm. and then everyone's crying 
yeah. over the loss of Sarazawa, which was a very powerful scene. And then there's a moment with Emiko and Ogata where they're crying and she's holding on to him and he looks at her, but he doesn't look her in the eye. And he, he re repeats what Sarazawa said before he cuts the line. Like he said, be happy. And just the way he turns his head away from her, like he's just too ashamed to look at her. And then she just breaks down crying. Yeah. And it just like, it, it felt like maybe because the, the, her whole thing about going to see Sarazawa earlier in the movie was she was going to tell him that she wasn't going to marry him. She was in love with Ogata, but they never told him that. And I don't think they ever realized that he found out like when they're fighting over the auction destroyer and he yeah. see, you know, Sarazawa's watching her clean Ogata's wound. I don't think they ever realized that he found out. So I think in that moment when they both realized that that was his, his final words before he cut the line, they were just like so ashamed. Or Ogata, it seemed like Ogata felt shame. Yeah, like for I think for her it was shock. For him yeah. it was shame. And I think that they both really brought like that that whole scene is just beautifully acted, like yeah. master class level stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that like I mean I, I it successfully like it it's that whole scene successfully captures like the grief of Godzilla dying because that's a creature that can't be studied any longer the grief of Sarazawa's sacrifice, the shame of Ogata, like, being it lifted up. Yeah, yeah, it broke his heart. Like, the, just the shock and devastation of, um, of, I mean, like, it's just, all of it was just, a, all of these emotions brought together, and I think that that moment, those actors successfully brought that, which, mm -hmm. ooh, I love that. Very emotionally thought provoking. So, like, obviously, speaking of emotions, because you know me, I like talking about emotions. Now, over the years, I feel like Godzilla impacts us as as we grow. Like, <laughs> duh, hence the title of the show, right? <laughs> so, how, how has Godzilla shaped you into the person you are today? How has Godzilla helped you grow into who you've become? Well, I don't think I would have ever gotten into writing or amateur filmmaking um, had I not watched those movies. So definitely it spurred my creativity because what's more creative than the Godzilla franchise? You could go on for hours about that. Yeah. Um, and it's just several ways. My love of foreign films in general, not just Japanese ones, but, you know, European. Like I'm a big fan of spaghetti westerns. Mm -hmm. which you know obviously completely different genre but you know there's certain similarities oh yeah um, for sure i think the way you look at world events um that was definitely what the godzilla series did a lot for that because i don't know what my opinion of dropping the bombs on japan in world war ii would be had i not gotten into the series and likewise into the history of Japan and mm -hmm. you know what they went through. I would say that the films definitely kind of give us an entry point when it comes to historical context, right? Because yeah. I know like even for me, like I would have never understood any of that had I not had that perspective depicted. And which I think brings us back to why I think films and art and, and writing and so on and music are so important because like it gives us that representation it gives us that perspective it gives us that context that i think based on our lives and what we have in our periphery we may not always understand without that assist right so i mean so you did you mentioned fan fiction so when did you start writing fan fiction um uh, when i was very very young i would say uh first grade i think i would um you know because our teacher would read to us all the time and there was lots of books that i found interesting there was one about a a big tractor that 
was alive basically mm -hmm. so i wrote a few books i guess of my own on colored paper of my own version of that story and then i, I would you know move on to you know drawing godzilla books where there'd be like like one sentence and then a picture of something happening i and used I to think, do that um, too oh yeah i still have them around here somewhere i've got oh. a few of them left um oh i like i want to say i want to uh, say maybe shortly after getting a, i think rodan's roost i might have read some people's uh fan fiction and said well i can do that and then started writing my own and you know writing fan fiction and then creating my own characters which i would still call fan fiction because a lot of it was inspired by the films i guess it's looking back at your history of writing fan fiction so like obviously you've written fan fiction strictly in the godzilla universe but you've also written your own fan fiction like like in, with your own original characters uh, do you want to talk about a few of them well sure well i think the the one that I, I i did the most work on was the was armadon which is a giant psychic armadillo yes <laughs> and i i will always remember that your username on kaiju galaxy i think was armadon wasn't it oh five something like that yeah you literally joined in 2005 so like i was like putting the pieces together but anyway yep. continue <laughs> yeah um i remember i was freaking out for a little bit because i found out there was a character on a oh i think primal rage that had the same name i'm like oh no i'm gonna get in trouble <laughs> even though i'm not making any money <laughs> but i think i i came to peace with that eventually and um the stories weren't particularly deep. They were pretty straightforward, but I did kind of learn about lore building. And um, I, I think I did a couple different stories that were set in like a mystical fantasy time, sort of Lord of the Rings-esque. I'm sure I was mm -hmm. watching those movies at the time. Um, I actually did one that was inspired by you because I knew how much you liked Mothra. I did some story about, uh, I forgot what I called it, but it was Ghidorah was the bad guy. He was going to come wipe out the earth. And these, these warriors had to go across the land and find all these, um, oh, what would you call them? Oh, I think, weren't they God like monsters. Men. Oh, I rem I think I remember this story. <laughs> and it was, there was Mothra who was basically the, the main hero of the story, but like basically any monster that, had people chanting at them i think except for king kong was in it there was king seesaw manda um oh man who else king seesaw manda varan was in it wasn't, varan doesn't get doesn't get enough love wasn't baragon in it too maybe i'm a, I'm a big baragon stand so it's so. possible i have a vague but, memory of that yeah, I think I, I wrote that I wanted to I wanted to make you happy because I knew how much you love Mothra. <laughs> you did. You did. <laughs> oh my goodness. I love looking back on those on those old the old stories that we used to write because like I feel like I mean I feel like our fan fiction shows people where we were with our love of the universe at the time, mm -hmm. right? And I think that if you look at them over the years, like you can see just how they shift and how, you know, some of them might not have, you know, some of them might not have a lot of depth. Others might have depth. Others might be, might have too much depth. I know some of mine, some of my later fanfics, I was trying to do too much in them. And oh. it was like a confusing, massive, a, a fuck tangle of <laughs> confusion. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but you it know, was a way to get the angst out, the angst yeah. and whatever you were dealing with. And, Oh yeah. I was coming out at the time and I remember like it was just oh it was it was a lot of a lot of interesting stuff going on. In That's a good time to be creative. And it, it it was absolutely needed, let me tell yeah. you. Now when it comes to well you have you collected before? Do you like collecting? Um mostly soundtracks. 
there isn't really, I mean, besides maybe the Beatles and stuff like that and some old rock and roll, my fa I, my favorite thing to listen to is movie soundtracks. Um, I did collect a lot as a kid. Um, I, I know this this one comes up a lot, but, you know, we didn't get a lot of Heisei films except for maybe the first two mm -hmm. up until uh, the late 90s. Yeah. So I, but they had all the toys coming out. So you had like Hasey Ghidorah and Godzilla. I had I had two like twelve inch tall figures that would walk and roar, and that was that brought me I a lot of joy. Those. I had a uh, oh I don't even remember the company that made them. I had these little ones that all had a button somewhere on the body that would make them make noise. Like I had the Hasey Mothra. It was on her back. I had a guy again. It was like somewhere in his buzz saw. Um, I think I had a space Godzilla. I had a pretty tall, um, Pacey Mecha Godzilla with the eyes would light up. I still have the, uh, Biolante one back here that, uh, oh, it doesn't, it does not roar anymore. I tried fixing her and I think something is fused in her electronics. So, mm -hmm. and I, that's way above my, it's way above my knowledge base, but I don't do, I mean, I think you and I talked about this before. Like we don't do like a lot of collecting anymore. Like I sometimes will get like a plush every now and then, but yeah. um, you know, like I really do like love collecting the soundtracks as well these days because um, I just, I, I love them dearly. I, I will never forget my first time at G Fest in 2007. I, I bought like two figures, but I spent $200 buying the, very very rare like multi-disc soundtracks of the mothra trilogy oh wow from someone who was probably charging me a little too much oh probably <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i've listened to those so much they uh, they've gotten their worth over the years yeah. let's just say <laughs> yeah so let, let's talk about filmmaking for a second because like fan like writing is one of your passions like what about filmmaking you've created great lummox productions talk about yeah. that i've been doing short films since i was about 12 years old and of course like the first thing we did was a little monster movie it wasn't a giant monster movie but i know that we used a lot of sound effects and music from the godzilla series and that's pretty much all me and my friends made for several years until i think I we finally started writing i remember the first one that we successfully finished with a script of sorts was a, a Frankenstein, well, Universal Monsters short film. Mm -hmm. Almost not a short film. It was just under an hour long. And we did, we edited it in black and white. You know, we all played different characters from all the Universal movies. It's called House of the Monsters. It's actually on the channel. Mm -hmm. I was the Frankenstein monster. My friend, I had a friend play Dracula, the wolf band. Dracula had a bride that falls in love with the wolf man and Igor's in it. Not with a hunch on his back, because that's a, a strange misconception about Igor is that he's a hunchback, but he's just he's actually a a crazy guy that survived being hanged. So mm -hmm. he's got the broken neck. Ah. Um a little more recently, like we're still me a couple of my friends still live up here. We still do short films from time to time. I um, love something. That. What's that? I said I love that. No, I mean, it's, I'd like to start making money at it eventually, but I'm not quite there yet. Um, something I've, I've kind of experimented with lately is something called rescoring, where you take a scene from a movie and you layer on music from a different movie. And I've done that with a couple scenes of uh, the monster verse. I did uh, the the sea battle on Godzilla versus Kong uh, changed all the sound effects to be like the, all the old Toho movies. Oh, I, love I that. think, I think that's something that really stands out to Godzilla fans. That's one of the things that stood out to me when I saw Shin Godzilla was it was this brand new movie looked like a brand new movie, but all the sound effects, even the tanks firing, the bombs exploding, the buildings crumbling, Godzilla's roar was all just, taken from the Showa era, and I thought that was very stylish and cool. So I did something like that, layered on a, a song from a 
Thunderball, which was the fifth James Bond film. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's, I mean, you just have to watch it. It's, <laughs> it's different, but it's, it's a fun thing to do because I'm such a big fan of film soundtracks and, you know, I'll watch scenes from movies and be like, I wonder what this would look like with this music over it. And, well, it can change the feel of the scene, right? It can completely yeah. change the context, the feel. What it, What is your dream short film to make? A dream short film? Well, my my ultimate goal would hopefully to be one day to direct a monster movie. Maybe Godzilla. I don't know if that's in the books, but that mean that would be a dream come true to make a Godzilla movie, or really any monster movie. I got you know that's what got me into wanting to do stuff. So I'd love to actually add something to the franchise. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that like, that's kind of one of my goals as well as a writer. Like I would love to write for something, you know, Godzilla oriented of some sort. So I do have one final question for you. This has been such a great conversation, by the way. Now, what advice do you have for Godzilla fans who may be new to the franchise? And, like, if you have, like, any advice you would may want to impart to, like, writers or filmmakers, feel free to share. All right. Well, to start with new fans, don't be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to like what you're going to like, and other people are going to like what they're going to like. If Like, if you're an old school fan like me, like, I, there isn't anything Godzilla related that I don't like. There's things in a lot of Godzilla stuff I don't like. Um, but me personally, I don't really hate anything mm-hmm. from the Godzilla franchise. Like there's not a movie or a show that I just can't stand. I'm still watching singular point. I haven't finished it yet. It's pretty interesting so far, but there's going to be younger people that just don't like the suit mm-hmm. I think it's great. I think it's, I love the suit mation, but you're going to, you're going to run into people that aren't going to be into the same things as you. And that's fine. Absolutely. There's, there's the gatekeeping and which is weird that it still exists. And I, I feel like as I got older, maybe I would see less of that, but you go on certain Facebook groups and it's very much still there. Mm-hmm. When Godzilla yeah. minus one came out, everyone started hating on Shin Godzilla for some reason. I know I'm on this like weird, in between of not caring about those people while also being petty and calling them out. Like the pink Zilla haters. Oh my God. Oh, <laughs> careful. You're going to get me on a tangent with that one. <laughs> no, like it's just like so exhausting. I'm just like, like I understand preferences and everything, but really like they're not yeah. trying to barbify Godzilla. You know, they're no. not like, like st- people are wild. People are wild. Yeah. That's, that's something else. God what about, because he's pink. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, what about, so like, what about filmmakers and writers? Like what did, cause like you, I mean, have been writing and filmmaking for years. Like if there's somebody interested in getting into either one of those things, like what insight do you have for those people? Um, just work with what you got. Um, cause I'm on limited funds. So I've got like a microphone, a couple of microphones and a camera, some editing software. So, you know, work with what you got, uh, do the best you can and just be creative. Like a lot of the best stuff was done with very little and don't, and also don't be afraid of criticism because it's, you're only going to get better that way. Um, if you, like if like if you want to get into writing and you got other if you know people that are writers send them your stuff and that you know they're going to be critical but they're also going to push you in the direction of doing better absolutely and the same goes for for filmmaking and it's going to hurt your feelings mm-hmm. <laughs> i had to, we released a, a short horror film this past halloween got a few comments a decent amount of views surprisingly well, at least for what i'm used to and everyone had nice things to say about it. Some people called out some logical inconsistencies, and it's just like, ah, whatever. But then one person called it unwatchable, and I was like, damn, that's kind of mean. But you know, <laughs> people maybe terrible. it was unwatchable for that person. <laughs> but so you're the, gonna, yeah. Well, it's the thing the only is, way you're gonna get better. Yeah, and the thing is, like, and I've learned this now that I've writing as part of my career at this point. Like, 
you can you also have the power to pick and choose what feedback you choose to receive and apply when it comes to growing like like i like thinking of poetry for example i might have somebody be like well that's a trash poem it doesn't make sense blah 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 and i can be like okay that that's not doing much to help me like like how oh. how are you helping me to help you understand this if you're going mm -hmm. to just call it trash right no so no you'll, i think it's, it's going it'll be obvious what's constructive and what isn't yeah like what's constructive versus who is being just a, a general miserable troll person, you know, because no. that's what, that's what they're doing. But Jesse, this has been such a wonderful conversation and it has been years in the making and it has yes. finally happened. And I want you to know that you are always welcome to come back whenever you would Well, you like. better make a spot for me next season. Cause I will definitely be back. Well, there will be one then I'm already starting to plan out next season. So, and you'll potentially have a little, spot in the surprise episode i'm doing toward the end of the year to celebrate a certain website that we used to be on together so fantastic <laughs> no spoilers anyone right but anyway um jesse plugs for places people can go to find your stuff uh you can find me at great lummox films uh, i couldn't use great lummox productions for some reason it's called great lummox productions but you can find me on youtube at Great Lummox Films. Uh, if you go to any of our videos, you'll see links to our Facebook and Instagram, which we update when we feel like it. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my friend, thank you for joining me today as always. And everyone, don't forget that Growing Up with Godzilla premieres on the first and third Sunday of each month relatively at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, Click like for the algorithm, subscribe to our channels, share it around, and don't forget to keep standing tall. All right. Bye, my friends.